Thank you very much for such a warm welcome and an amazing introduction, uh, Don. And it's been a privilege working with Tessa Tora over the past few years on uh, T News. Speaking of uh, T News, I think Nara Zittner is in the house this morning. I've been working with, with her and Billy White and many others on making uh, T News more accessible, especially for persons who use screen readers and screen enlargement and that sort of thing, as well as uh, with Chuck and those on the back end in terms of uh, enhancing the accessibility of Tessitura in terms of metadata and the ability to, to make things more inclusive for everybody. So it's just been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I want to talk with you this morning about welcoming the widest possible audience. How can we make our places, our institutions, our products, our services more accessible, more inclusive to as many people as possible? Um, before we get started, a couple, just really only one ground rule, and that is, uh, so for those of you who saw me walk onto the stage with a cane, I happen to be blind, which means that when I ask you questions, which I, I will do from time to time during this talk, uh, raising your hand or nodding is not going to work out so well, right? <laughs> so uh, the, the, the rule is, if, you're, if I ask you a question, if you're able to, please verbalize your response, like yes. Does that make sense? That was a test of the no nodding rule. Fantastic. Um, you're going to notice some hashtags and such on the bottom of the slides. Um, it, there's my Twitter handle, at Sina Baram. If you want to join on social media just for ex accessibility presentation best practices, I'll spell that out, S-I-N-A-B-A-H-R-A-M. There's a hashtag for the conference, TLCC 2019. And then you'll notice A11Y. So A11Y is a numeronym. How many people here have heard of a numeronym before? OK, so there were, there were a lot fewer yeses than, than the last time. All right, so a, a numeronym is an acronym where you've taken away the middle part of the word. So accessibility, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-I-L-I-T-Y, you take away the C to the T, and you get 11 characters. That's why A11Y is the hashtag for accessibility. I-18N is internationalization, and so on. And so A11Y, the reason I put it on these slides and the reason I talk about it is it's a wonderful tribe of people out there who are interested in accessibility and inclusive design and really having these conversations online. I encourage you to use that hashtag on social media and in other places platforms to have that global conversation. So a little bit of background about myself. Um, when I was a young kid, I ended up, um, you know, I had a little bit of usable vision. And I was uh, able to, uh, you know, see some small print and like some, some large print and that sort of thing. Imagine me being around seven or eight years old. And essentially what ended up occurring was that I was playing tennis and practicing serving against the backboard. And then I basically you know, missed one of the shots, but it ended up coming back and hitting me in the face. And uh, as a result, I lost most of my usable vision uh, at that age, around seven or eight years old. Now, you know, the, the, the thing here to, to keep in mind is that this is a pretty traumatic and life-changing event. And so we, we get to this kind of decision points in our lives, and decisions matter. Um, and I think that you can influence how you feel. It doesn't mean that you can control how you feel, but you can influence how you feel. There's many factors in the world today that you know, can affect the way that we feel about things. But you have the ability to sometimes influence at least the emotional content and like how you get you know, the lens you look through the world at. And for me, I tried to take a look at that. You know, I was around about a year after or so that event, maybe eight, nine years old. And I remember very clearly making a distinct decision. And the decision was this. It was, look, I can let this define me and have it be a big deal and be a cause of frustration and, 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 and pain and so forth. Or I can take it for what it is, accept it, and then let it be an opportunity for me to find some, some you know, real uh, joy in life and to use it as an asset. And that lens of productivity, that like idea that you can't control you know, which cards you're dealt, but how you play the hand, to quote Randy Posh, that's an idea that's really resonating, it really resonates with me, and it's something that I bring, uh, I try to bring to the work that we do. So make a long story short, I ended up going to university for computer science. Uh, there's an image of me on the screen uh, using a tablet, uh, which was part of my PhD work. So go Wolfpack. I went to NC State in North Carolina. Uh, did undergraduate and graduate degrees in, that, uh, in, in, in computer science. 
And I'm all about dissertation in a PhD in computer science, but I left the PhD to go play with museums and theaters and galleries and libraries and trying to make the world a little bit more inclusive. But as a result of that work, I was really, really, really honored by uh, President Obama in 2012 to be named a champion of change by the White House. And uh, this was a really meaningful honor because what it allowed uh, me to do is it allowed for the, uh, it, it allowed me to, to really like uh, get into the museum world. So I was not really interested in museums before because as a blind person, I thought oh, there's nothing there for me. It's going to be a bunch of stuff behind glass. There's not going to be visual descriptions, that sort of thing, right? And so I'll tell you a little bit more about how that event really influenced me in terms of getting me into museums. So anyways, to, to, to continue that story, I was in DC uh, for that event, right? And while I was there, I got to do a lot of cool stuff, the standard tourist stuff, right? You go to the Capitol building, but it was in December, which is really awesome, by the way, because when you go to DC in December, most of the politicians are gone. And so as a result, you know, you have the, the, the town sort of to yourself, right? And um, it's really powerful because, you know, you get to really explore things. Um, I was really lucky I had the gentleman who was in charge of all of accommodations for Congress to um, give me a personal tour of the Capitol building. And so as a result, I was able to like go in and touch stuff. There's the Hall of Statues. And you know, he was like, yeah, you can touch this. And here's this cool thing with the sound effect in the, in the building where if you whisper over here, you can hear it 30, 40 feet away. And you know, there was this really experiential aspect to that, to that whole uh, thing. And so while I was there, in the Hall of Statues, there is a uh, bronze statue of Helen Keller. This is a kind of iconic um, uh, Helen Ke uh, Keller scene, right? So the water pump and, and, and so on and so forth. And there's Braille on the statue, which is awesome, right? So they've, there's Braille in bronze on the statue. Now, there's one little tiny problem. Uh, there's a typo in the Braille, right? <laughs> so. Uh, this is not to give them a hard time about, you know, having a typo in the Braille. One, one would suggest perhaps a few more hours of proofreading before casting in solid bronze, but, you know, <laughs> mistakes, mistakes happen, right? And the trick is, you know, to recognize that we're not always going to get things right the first time. And if we allow that to stop us, then we're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, and it's totally counterproductive. Thing, you know, just way of looking at things, in my opinion. And so as a result, I really, like that example resonates with me and like, you're not gonna get it right the first time, that's okay, let's fail forward, let's iterate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. So I've been talking about some terms, accessibility, disability, inclusive design, and stuff like that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna define some of those, but I think it's really important to understand what, um, you know, what some of these terms are so we can be on the same page. So accessibility, right? Um, the definition I've got up on the screen is the ability of all people to use a product, a service, a place, but independent of disability. So that independent of disability portion, super important, right? Because accessibility tends to concentrate on mitigating the results of disability. And that's, that's fantastic and that's important, but I think there's some other strategies we'll talk about this morning that uh, tend to have accessibility as an outcome, but it makes it better for everybody. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So let's discuss disability, though, because I've mentioned that without defining it, right? So what is disability? Disability is the consequence of an impairment. It can be cognitive, emotional, olfactory, aural, visual, like myself, mobility, right? Or a combination of these things. And so then the question becomes, all right, we've, we've sort of thought about accessibility and disability. What are some ways that we treat disability? What are some ways of thinking about disability? And there's two models that I wanted to talk to you about this morning. Now, please keep in mind, there is an entire field of critical disability studies. And so this is in no way a, a summary of that really important academic field. It's just two uh, stark examples in my mind that really bring home the reason for doing the work that we do. So the first one is the medical model. You break your arm, you go to the doctor, you get a cast, hopefully it heals up, you're good to go. The thing got fixed. Something was temporarily broken, there was an impairment, and it got fixed. 
But then what happens when it doesn't get fixed? What happens if it's not able to be cured or remediate, remediated in some way? Then what we do in the medical model is we view the person as disabled, right, as having a disability. So let's contrast that with the social model of disability. The social model of disability shows us that it's the environment that is disabling, not the individual that is disabled. So the idea being that it's not the fact that it's not you're not disabled because you can't open the door. The environment is disabling because there's no kick button or push bar to automatically open that door. Does that make sense? Okay, and so how do we make our environments less disabling? What do we do so that we don't end up making them exclusionary? And that's where this idea of inclusive design comes in. So inclusive design is a design process in which you concentrate on the fact that people use things specifically. They bring their own experiences, their own backgrounds, their own differences of ability to the things that we make. This can be content, this can be a website, this can be a mobile app, this can be a play, an exhibit, a building, right? Anything like that. And so the idea is what decisions can we be thinking about from the very get-go, from the very beginning at the design phase, so that we are not being exclusionary and we make our things adaptable and dynamic. And I'll be talking more about how to do that a little bit this morning. But that's the idea of inclusive design. Now, you'll hear me also sometimes say things like universal design. How many people in the room have heard of universal design? Yes, all right, so the idea there is that it's, it's, it's a very similar concept, it's an older concept coming out of Ronald L. Mace's work in the 60s and 70s, uh, a lot of influence um, for uh, accommodating architecture for uh, elderly populations, you know, that sort of thing. And inclusive design resonates a little bit more with me because, well, first of all, it basically has the word inclusion in it, so I feel like that's really important. And number two, it broadens the consideration area to not just because of things as a result of disability, but also background or gender identity or any of these other things that make up this, you know, tapestry we call humanity, right? And so I find that inclusive design is a really neat uh, uh, design process to facilitate this inclusion and this enhancement of accessibility that I'm talking about. All right, so why does this matter? Why are we talking about this stuff this morning, right? Well, one way of looking at it is just purely from the numbers, right? Over a billion people with a B have some form of disability in the world. And actually, that's, that's closer to 1.5 approaching 2 billion now, all right? The 110 to 190 million have a severe impairment. These numbers are only going up. And the reason is that, to be quite frank, babies are not dying, which is good but that means that they may grow up with one or more disabilities. And so this is, the, this is the, 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 the landscape of humanity that we need to be aware of as content creators, as designers, as developers, as business owners, what have you, because these are going to, this, this is the people that we're trying to serve. One out of every five people uh, has a disability. Over the age of 35, one out of two. Right? So these are not small numbers, and it's really significant and important. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So um, now that we've defined a few terms, disability, inclusive design, accessibility, that sort of thing, I wanted to then take a brief opportunity to tell you a little bit about PAC. Now, in this audience, PAC means Performing Arts Center, right? PAC, <laughs> right? Some other audiences, like the ones up in DC, Political Action Committee, and so on and so forth, right? So we all, we all do our own thing with acronyms, and that's totally cool. For me, uh, PAC stands for Prime Access Consulting. It's the name of my company and something I started about seven, eight years ago, and really uh, have been focusing, I mean, we've had the real privilege of working with dozens of organizations so far on inclusive design and accessibility. This can be mobile apps, websites, 360, AR, VR, you, you name it, that doesn't matter, the experiential design. What matters is figuring out how to take 
any type of service offering or content or thing and making sure that as many people can enjoy it and that can really experience that shared feeling of delight at the same time. If, for example, a person with a disability goes wow at a piece of content the same time as their friend who can, let's say, perfectly see the content or hear the content can, then that's a win in my book, right? Because then that experience is able to be shared and those people are now brought into a broader discussion and they're not excluded because of ability or background. Right. Um, I'm joined in this work by Corey Timpson, who is here at the conference uh, this week. Uh, I, I always describe Corey as the only other human on the planet that I trust on inclusive design and accessibility. So I suppose it's really good that we work so much together. Um, and he's just a fantastic, fantastic expert in this field of inclusive design and accessibility. Previously, Vice President of Canadian Museum for Human Rights, who I believe we also have uh, in the house this morning, and who I'll be showing some examples from later in this uh, later in this talk. Okay. So what are some examples of universal and inclusive design? Well, uh, what we have, like the, the most obvious example, I think, is a curb cut. You guys are familiar with a curb cut? Yeah. All right. So you know, you have a change in elevation, sidewalk goes to road, that kind of thing. You have a ramp so that if you're a wheelchair user, you're not forced to hop the curb, right? Makes sense, pretty cool concept. Here's a problem. The problem is that if you happen to be using a cane, and by the way, I should point out, curb cuts, while they are critical for persons using a walker or a wheelchair, the majority of people who use curb cuts are People in roller skates or wheelchairs, parents with strollers, people with luggage at the airport, somebody with a grocery cart, right? These are the things that they're, they're critical for one audience, but they're enhancing and they're augmentative. They're making it better for everybody. That's really the core of the benefits of universal and inclusive design. So we have these curb cuts. Things are going great. Uh, wheelchair users don't have to hop the curb. Everybody's happy. So now you're blind and you're walking down the sidewalk. And let's say it's a very smooth transition. This happens a lot at like parking garages and that kind of thing. It's a very smooth transition between the sidewalk and the driveway portion, right? So now you may not know that you've entered a path where there are vehicles coming by. Now, in like the 80s or 90s or whatnot, maybe this was, I mean, it was never okay, but at least it was a little bit mitigated by the fact that cars were rather loud. These days, cars are not rather loud, right? Which is a good thing, right? So Teslas and other things are pretty quiet. Um, unfortunately, they are also rather, you know, uh, they, they hurt a lot when they hit you. And so we want to avoid this, right? So we didn't go and say, hey, you know what? Well, we tried the curb cuts thing. Uh, doesn't work for blind people in certain situations. I guess we're gonna just like can that idea, right? No, we iterated forward. We said, what if we put some bumps on it? All right, cool, that sounds great. Let's put some bumps on it. Is that gonna be a tripping hazard? No, because we can dome over those bumps, make sure that they don't cause a tripping hazard. You can still run a, ro uh, a roller skate over it or a stroller, a wheelchair, so it doesn't take away from that previous audience that it was critical for. It's just one layer of enhancing it for everybody else or for some, some other audience that was excluded temporarily in some side edge case. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So. Uh, I wanted to show you this video. Um, I'll do, this is kind of ironic because uh, usually I'm the one consuming audio description, not giving the audio description for a video. So, so, so I, I, I enjoy this. Um, but I'll describe what's, what you're gonna see in the, in the, in the video. So in the video, uh, it's thinking about how do we make an escalator inclusive? Now, how do we make building accessible is kind of a different story because, of course, you know, we have elevators. Elevators can make something accessible. But are they necessarily inclusive if you're asking somebody who's a wheelchair user to turn around and to be separated from the group, take an alternate path, that sort of thing? I find that, you know, that's maybe a little bit separate, you know, it, it, it separates uh, crowds and groups. So, this is out of uh, Japan. You're going to see an escalator. The stairs are going to collapse. So instead of one stair per, per unit, you'll see three stairs sort of make a platform. Wheelchair rolls on, rides that platform all the way up the escalator. So I think that's pretty cool, right? By the way, the ding is a total audio hack, right? Because I, since the video is silent, I have no idea when it's over, right? <laughs> so that's what that was all about. Also, your toast is ready. Um, so that's, 
that's an example of like, okay, it sounds a little ridiculous at first. It's an escalator, a wheelchair, and like that's an engineering problem, and, and we're able to fix these things. So it challenges some assumptions about you're in a wheelchair or you can't see, so therefore you cannot participate in this thing, right? And I, I, I like challenging those assumptions because I find that that's where some, some innovation really gets to occur. So I want to talk with you this morning about some principles from inclusive and universal design. I said earlier, um, I'm borrowing from both. I really like to conflate you know, inclusive and universal design. I, I find that by taking the best from both frameworks, you're able to really come up with a great strategy. But I feel it's important to point out, you know, these are not the seven principles of universal design. It's borrowed a little bit from that. And it's not the principles of inclusive design. Borrowed a little bit of that and wanted to concentrate on those things that resonated the most with me and I thought would be enjoyed uh, by, by you guys this morning. So let's get started. Equitable use. So can people with different abilities get an equitable experience? This is really key. Can they get an equitable experience? Not an equivalent experience, but an equitable one. And the reason I concentrate on that word equitable is because it really releases you from letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Instead, you can strive for the same emotional context, the same uh, uh, idea that is being transferred, let's say in print as opposed to in audio, the same type of uh, experience so you can share it and discuss it with a friend. So can they experience an equitable one? Right. What we see in the photo here is a gentleman who uses a wheelchair being able to sit uh, by uh, um, a young woman who's sitting in a, a stadium seat, in a, a theater uh, seating, but they're able to sit side by side because there's a facility for the wheelchair to sit right there. Um, that you can see uh, one version of something called the U Universal Keypad or UKP at Canadian Museum for Human Rights. I'll talk a little bit more about that. They're a Tessitura partner, by the way. Um, and what's really interesting here, you don't see this in the photo, but where they're sitting, they're also uniquely positioned to see the captioning as well as the sign language that makes this video uh, uh, mo even more inclusive and accessible. There's a headphone jack on that UKP, on that universal keypad that lets you plug in for audio description, lets you get enhanced audio if you're hard of hearing, and a lot of different kinds of affordances. It's both available in English and French. That means English and French the language of the video, the audio description, the sign language, right? And so it's really trying to be adaptive and enhance for, for everybody. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at this next example. So the next photo basically shows a multi-person, multi-touch uh, environment. This is over at SF MoMA, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And what, uh, what's going on there is it's a triptych display. Uh, there's three, imagine, life-sized iPads by one another, right? And you're touching the screens. You're able to manipulate the art and zoom in and get some detailed viewing, that kind of thing. How in the world do you make that accessible, right? Like if somebody can't see, they're going to get this glass wall. What do you do about it, right? If you're low vision, how can we have some, some zooming capability that lets you actually appreciate the artwork visually, right, as best as you're able? And so the idea is that put a button on it, put a braille label, a headphone jack, right? You push the button, it begins talking through your headphones. There's this onboarding process, right? So if you already know how to use it, you can just skip it. And then you can dive into the content. You can swipe just like you would on an iPhone. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And it reads it to you. But it's also thinking about this idea of an equitable experience. So when there's thumbnails on the screen, you get short visual descriptions of the artworks. When you tap on them to zoom in on them, get a more detailed view, really takes up the whole viewport, well, then you get a longer visual description. So this way, you're able to have an equitable experience not only on your own, but with somebody else who says, oh, that one looks interesting. Let's go check that one out. I want to learn more about that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Number two. Give control. Can people access and interact with your content in their preferred ways? We all have different ways of interacting with content. So the idea here is that 
that universal keypad that I talked about, there's two versions of it. This is the more fully functioned version of the, the, the universal keypad, a Canadian Museum for Human Rights. We see 13 rubberized buttons. There's a back home and, uh, uh, back home and help. There's up, down, left, right, and an enter key, kind of like a, a D-pad on a, on a game controller, right? There's zoom in and zoom out, volume up and down, and an audio button to let you switch between enhanced audio, you know, to really amplify the audio for someone who's hard of hearing, or descriptive audio to turn on things like a screen reader to interact with all of the, the interactives, the digital interactives at the museum. What's really cool about this is that this is a consistent affordance. So it's not a one-off. It's something that's always there. There's a floor marker that lets you feel with your foot when, you know, when you're at the right spot. If you're a cane user like myself, you can, it's feelable there as well. Of course, again, it's not a tripping hazard, right? And that way you know you can reach your hand out UKP is going to be right there. Headphone jack is going to be right there. Bluetooth beacon is going to tell you the content that's all around you. And in this way, we're making the environment accessible to as many people as possible, but also on their terms, because they can use their mobile device to access that content, in addition to the digital interactives, which of course are accessible. Another thing to keep in mind is even if you have accessible touch screens, something like a keypad can still be helpful. Think about somebody with a hand tremor or an, an issue where you really like holding your arm up on a touch screen can be very tiring on certain muscles. So it's important to have these redundancies in what we do. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So um, number three, make things easy. All right. Is your content intuitive, easy to access, right, and consistent? So the idea here is we see um, this uh, gender uh, neutral bathroom sign, right? Uh, it's important to point out it concentrates on the function, not the person, right? So there's a picture of a toilet. It doesn't say men, it doesn't say women. It's not that half man, half woman icon that's been going around, right? It concentrates on the function. There's a toilet in there, right? And so I feel like that's really just a key takeaway. Corey, I, th I, think, I think Corey Timpson probably has sent and received more emails on gender neutral, neutral restrooms than any human I know, right? And so this is really, really key. Um, it's universal. You don't have to, to you know, uh, translate that from a language perspective as long as you can see that icon. If you can't, there's Braille in both English and French. Uh, the letters are embossed, so you can read it uh, that way as well. There's the symbol to let you know there's a changing table uh, in the room, in, in, the, in the washroom, as well as um, the universal handicap symbol to let you know that like, there's grab bars and things of this nature. So like there's all of these affordances on this one sign to prevent you from needing to know some specific piece of information, like being able to speak English or being able to, you know, speak, um, uh, to be, being able to see in order to just know, hey, where are the restrooms? Right? So does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Number four, context matters. Can people interact with your content in a dynamic environment? We are all in dynamic environments. I was doing a tech demo in here yesterday. This room was pretty empty, right? Now it's not. I mean, I don't know. They could be lying to me, and there's really nobody here. But, <laughs> but it's kind of it's a really good audio trick. So I'm going to go with you guys actually exist. Um, and so. That's, you know, like these environments change. You go to an aquarium uh, when there's like nobody there, nice and silent, right? Three school groups show up. It's about 105 decibels in there, right? I measured it because I was curious how much hearing I was losing, right? It's a big deal, right? I take that one kind of, you know, I'm kind of sensitive to the hearing thing. So like, it's, it's really important. I rely on that. And so these environments change. They change in lighting. They change in all sorts of temperature. Right? And so we want to make sure that the affordances we're coming up with and the way that we translate our content is able to withstand that, that dynamism, that changing environment. Um, what we see here is a photo of a relaxed uh, performance. Uh, this is from the London Theater. Uh, there's, um, you can see that one of, the, one of the kids in the photo who's at the relaxed performance is wearing headphones to filter out some frequencies. This is used a lot by my friends who are on the autism spectrum and want to filter out certain frequencies that are, that are pretty like irritating or, or just harmful, right? So that's really important. Um, it's a relaxed performance. The lights can stay on. It's okay if you need to go 
uh, use the restroom a lot because maybe you're, you know, you happen to be pregnant, right? Um, it's, it's all right if somebody might have an utterance that they can't control because there's this shared relationship and understanding between the actors, the house, the visitors, the staff, everybody about what the expectations are and the idea that we want to make sure that this art is accessible to as many people as possible. So let's make that happen. And a relaxed performance is one of those ways. By the way, also captioning, sign language, et cetera, to make sure that it's accessible, audio description as well. Does that make sense? OK. So five, tolerance for error. Can people always return to a known starting point no matter what they do? So how many people in here have had this experience where you're using some technology, it could be a kiosk or something like that, maybe a, a website or a computer program, and you're trying to get something done, right? And you get into this state where you're like, I don't know how I got here, I really don't want to be here, I just want to get my thing done, and how do I get out of this? Have you ever had that experience? Yeah. So two things. Number one, I view that as a failure of the design and implementation, right? And I'm a computer scientist. I can throw all of my people under the bus, right? We failed when we made that, right? Because it should be about the people. We should not, it's, it's 2019. We don't need to be catering our behaviors to technology anymore. It should be going the other way around. And so the idea here is um, an undo button, right? Um, it's pretty straightforward. Can you offer the person a facility to undo something? Maybe it was something they did, maybe it was something the system did, but can you go back to a state where you were more comfortable and you can resume your path? Does that make sense? Okay, number six. There's seven of these. We're almost done. All right, number six, low physical effort. Now, I want to caveat this one. I know it says low physical effort. This totally applies to digital interfaces. Think of an example uh, of a really, really accessible uh, digital audio workstation, right? So a piece of software that lets you create music and mix audio tracks and do all of that sort of thing. You can make it super accessible with the keyboard, right? But if you have to hit the tab key 50 times to get to something instead of one little shortcut key, that's not exactly low physical effort, right? So this, these ideas apply to digital as well as physical environments. I just want to make that really, really, uh, uh, excuse me, really, really clear. But what we see here in the photo is um, two side by, uh, excuse me, um, a, uh, the UKP, the, the universal keypad that I spoke about earlier with a bench. By the way, it's important when we talk about benches to have some with armrests, some without to facilitate transitional seating, right? Backs are very important and that sort of thing. And the UKP, I talked about the headphone jack earlier. Now, what's really important to keep in mind is we talked about low physical effort and making sure somebody with a tremor, for example, would still be able to use things. So we shouldn't make it difficult to plug the actual headphones into the UKP. So it's conically shaped, and it lets gravity help you. If you get it close enough, it sort of falls in. So you have to apply less pressure to get the headphone plug plugged in. It's a little thing, but it can actually make a very significant difference. Does that make sense? All right, number seven, size and space for approach and use. So again, totally applies to digital interfaces, not just the physical world. Think of a crowded user interface which a, with a bunch of icons on it, or a, a, a list that you're trying to delete something out of, and the delete, you know, the delete key is super, the delete button is super, super tiny, and you can barely get your mouse over it. These things affect us in both the physical and digital worlds. So what we see here, uh, and, the, and the idea, by the way, is is there enough space to maneuver and interact? And the photo shows um, two sides by sides, one, uh, uh, one is a, uh, a you know, open hallway, plenty of room to maneuver. You could be using a wheelchair, uh, a, a mobility device, uh, crutches, what have you. Plenty of room to turn around, walk with somebody else, holding somebody's elbow, for example. It's all good. The second one is a pretty crowded art gallery where it's a little bit more difficult, right? You don't have as much space to maneuver around or to turn or, you know, without potentially damaging something or, or just being unable to go back the way you came. So that's kind of a stark contrast, and we see this in physical spaces, and again, we see it in digital ones as well. Do those make sense? All right, we made it through the seven, the seven principles we wanted to talk about this morning. So I mentioned earlier that inclusion can lead to innovation, right? And so one of the things that I wanted to uh, show you is an audio recording. So we're going to listen to this in a second. And the way, you know, what it is, is the audio description. Um, do we have Steppenwolf in the house today? 
So Steppenwolf here in Chicago is doing some amazing work um, on just making their environment more inclusive, more accessible. And what they did was for this show, it was a one-man show. It featured um, an individual uh, you know, with mental illness. There's things going on there. There's multiple screens of content. The actor is doing stuff. One human doing the audio description is not going to cut it. That person would have to literally say multiple things at the same time. So, they didn't just, again, give up and say, oh, well, it's going to be too difficult to audio describe that. Had multiple audio describers. And so then they panned the audio, one hard left, right in the left ear, one hard right in the right ear, and one in the middle. So you have three voices going on. Now, in this room, you're not going to get the stereo effect as much. So it's going to sound a little bit more confusing. But uh, you know, stick with me on this. And so you're wearing some headphones, and these voices are then describing what's going on on the stage. But what I find kind of cool about this and kind of immersive about it is that because it's a show on, you know, a character with schizophrenia, with mental illness, it's really interesting to me that, that the way the audio description sounds is also like multiple voices in your head, and it sort of, it, it, it jives with the content that is being displayed. So let's, let's take a listen to that. That's forward stance. Stand. Sit. Stand. Sit. Standing. Sit. Twist. Sit. Hugs his knees to his chest. Staggers back to the chair and sits. Frozen. Stand. Diagonally. Sit. Narrow oval curls to the upper right. left. Twist. Blanket appears sit. written inside. Twist. So there was a lot going on there, right? And the thing is that when it's panned out, it's a lot more easy to understand. But I feel like that's a really cool idea to play with and to see what we can do to convey these sort of complex things that are going on simultaneously, but through a medium like audio. Does that, does that make some sense? So uh, what we see on the, on the slide here is a picture of Tim Cook, the, the CEO of Apple, right? And uh, he was at a um, stock shareholders meeting uh, a few years back. And one uh, very conservative hedge fund was giving him a lot of uh, trouble about Apple's expenditures and green technology and that sort of thing. Why are you spending money on this? And accessibility, why are you spending money on that, right? And Tim basically responds, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, Tim is pretty reserved guy, right? He, he doesn't, he's not really given to outbursts or anything like that. And he goes, when we, when we work on making our devices accessible to the blind, I don't consider the bloody ROI, the return on investment, right? So, you know, we're doing this for the right reasons. We want to leave the world better than we found it. And they tend to walk the talk on that. Now, here's the thing. Accessibility and the work that they've done on inclusive design has been very financially beneficial for Apple. It's opened up education markets for them, let them sold to various governments, et cetera. So it's a big deal, and it really offers a great deal of ROI. But that's not necessarily the motivation for doing that work. And I remember very clearly, by the way, when the first iPhone uh, came out, the head of development at a startup I was at comes into my room, plops a, a, a piece of glass on my desk. You know, I was using my old Nokia at the time, right? And puts, puts the iPhone 1 on my desk, and he's like, dude, are you totally screwed? Because it's a piece of glass, right? Right? I mean, like, it was a fair question, right? I mean, it's a totally fair question. Like, so, um, because there was like a button for the home key, there's up and down, you know? And, and so the idea is that you could look at that and be like, well, yes I am. Oh well, no more phones for blind people. Um, or you say, wait a minute, we know how to make touch screens accessible. People already had been working on that with PDAs. We've got better touch screens now. What about gestures, you know? And so they, they took that and innovation came out as a result of it. Those same technologies and approaches, that's what we used to make that SF MoMA panel accessible. That's what we used at, on other projects to make touch screens and those kinds of environments accessible. Does that make sense? Awesome. So I want to talk to you briefly about the Coyote Project. The Coyote Project uh, came out of a collaboration with the MCA Chicago. Again, here, here in town in Chicago, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art. And the idea is very simple. Um, the, the website for the museum was going under a redesign, and they wanted to make it accessible and inclusive, which is amazing. They were working with us on that. And they say, well, you know, we have 15 to 18,000 uh, images with no visual descriptions or labels. It's part of our content. So what do we do about that? Well, you can visually describe them. It's going to take a lot of work. It's 15 to 18,000 images, right? And so um, you then think about, well, how do you go about describing those? 
if you think about most content management systems, you know, WordPress, Drupal, that kind of thing, you get a single edit field, and that's all you get for visual description. I mentioned earlier about short versus long visual descriptions. There's spoken word visual descriptions. There's audio. What if you want to do the visual description in sign language? There's all of these different modalities we can use to describe things. And all you get from most of these platforms is a single line edit field with no spell check or ability to collaborate or anything. So we invented Coyote with MCA. It's an open source uh, platform that lets you uh, review, synthesize, edit, uh, share, approve, and disseminate visual descriptions. It doesn't store your images. There's plenty of other software for that. But it knows about your images. And it lets you assign them to different people in the institution to be described, right? You can write, like I said earlier, long and short visual descriptions. You can write them in different languages, which is really important. And you can have a multiple descriptions for the same painting, right? So if you think about perspectives and the biases that we bring to visual descriptions, uh, there's going to be different, uh, you know, different, different kinds of descriptions we're going to get. So for example, think of, think of a young, um, young man out of Baltimore, a man of color, how is he going to describe a Kerry James Marshall piece versus middle-aged white woman working in a museum, right? Those, those are both valid voices, but how do you account for all of them? How do you account for this multiplicity of voices in description like we're trying to do in other aspects of our organization? So Coyote facilitates that as well. And there's a screenshot on the, on the screen that lets you see a little bit of the user interface in, in, in terms of the flow and the cues and that kind of thing. If you're interested about visual description, want to learn more about Coyote, totally happy to talk to you about that uh, this week at the conference. But I thought it would be cool to let you listen to uh, one of the visual descriptions that came out of Coyote. This is one that was written by the MCA, and uh, it, it's, it's something that I think kind of brings, brings home this idea. So this is a piece by Kerry James Marshall. I'm not going to do the visual description of the piece. We're going to let the computer read that for us. So let's go ahead and hit that. This painted portrait depicts a young woman with jet black skin holding a long, thin paintbrush up to a colorful, messy painter's palette. She is shown in a three-quarter pose, gazing directly at the viewer. Her face, which is central to the square composition, stands out against a large white canvas, almost blending into the pitch black background to her right. Closer inspection reveals, however, that her skin is subtly rendered, with various shades of contours and highlights. She wears two large hoop earrings, three small hoop earrings, and an oversized, boxy, high-collar jacket made of stiff fabric. Her voluminous hair, black with an otter sheen, rises in thick coils on top of her head. The canvas to her left shows a partly finished paint by number self-portrait. In it, her likeness is broken up into smaller segments with pale blue outlines and numbers. She has outlined many of the segments and filled them in with colors from her palette. Orange, blue, yellow, pink, brown, and a few shades of green. She uses brighter, more vivid colors to paint her jacket on the paint by number canvas, using bright oranges and greens rather than the deep mustards and maroons that are on the real life jacket. So I think that's a pretty cool description, right? I think that was an amazing job that they did, right? And, and they got on the MCA stage one afternoon, got some coffee and donuts, and wrote 300 of those, okay? and then wrote some more, right? They've up to, I think, over 3,300 descriptions last I looked at the dashboard, right? And some long ones, like that one, a lot of short ones for the website, for example, for the alt text. And you can see these, by the way, on MCA's website. Um, you, we actually made them visually apparent as well, so you can visually see the visual descriptions in addition to hearing them. And that's really important because visual descriptions are helpful not just for somebody who can't see, but for everybody. Now, I thought it would be really neat to show you, this is the text on the slide of what we just heard, okay? I'm not gonna read that out because I'm gonna have the computer do that too, but we just heard her do that, except I don't listen to that voice, right? I listen to a voice a little bit faster on my computer, uh, a, a lot faster, about 950 words per minute or so, and it's a little bit more robotic sounding, but I can really crank it. So I'm gonna let you listen to the exact same visual description. No words have been changed, I promise, but this is the speed and the comfort level that I listen to this content at. Okay. 
There you go. So, nice and easy, right? By the way, <laughs> being in grad school and like sort of maybe hypothetically forgetting to do the reading the night before, that skill really came in handy, all right? <laughs> it was super helpful, all right? And so, People experience content in different ways. That's not the problems that we need to solve. There's assistive technology, screen readers, screen magnifiers, different mobility assistive devices, the ability to speak to our, our, our technology, all of that sort of input output stuff that's being worked on and solved. The thing is that we gotta make our content accessible to that stuff. That voice, I can read at 950 words per minute. Doesn't matter how fast I can read if I cannot access the content on your website or if I cannot hit the button to buy the ticket in the mobile app. Does that make sense? Yeah. All, right. All right, so I want to talk to you about some tactile replicas. Um, these are tactile reproductions of Andy Warhol's work. This is from the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. And we were working with them, a gentleman named David Whitewolf, um, who made these amazing tactile reproductions in this material called acetal. And uh, you can touch it. You can totally feel them. It, the, the level of brightness maps to how high the, the, the computer etches something with a laser. And what's really amazing about these is that you can start feeling Andy's works. Very, very cool, right? So like the Campbell soup can, pretty iconic. But here's the thing, if you just throw a tactile reproduction at somebody, no matter how gorgeous, no matter how lovingly it was made, it's not, it's not always very clear what you're touching, right? Those same visual tricks don't apply in touch. And so a visual description to go along with a tactile reproduction is really, really, really helpful. Now, that gets us a good way of the ways there. We've heard a visual description or two just, just right now, right? But what if we can think about this in a slightly different way? So think about wayfinding, right? We think about wayfinding a lot about wayfinding in space, right? But we also wayfind through content. And so, I, you know, when, when Corey and I are working with a lot of uh, our, our clients, we talk about this a lot in terms of we want to think about the person and their entire experience. So if you think about a tactile reproduction, the entire experience is you're feeling something. Wouldn't it be cool if you were giving, being told some things as you were feeling something? So what we're about to hear is the audio track. It's like the first um, 80, 90 seconds or so. It actually goes on for about four or five minutes of what you would hear in the app as you were touching the physical reproduction of Andy's work that's in front of you. And this is read by uh, JJ up in Toronto, an amazing audio describer that we have the pleasure of working with on these projects. This color screen print depicts a large can of Campbell's cream of mushroom soup against a white backdrop. The top half of the can's label is red, which is recessed, and the lower half is white, which is raised. Bridging the two halves at the center of the label is a small, heavily textured gold emblem. More on that in a moment. Let's begin at the top of the piece, where you will find the can's sealed lid, represented by raised concentric arches inside an oval. Move your left hand to the left corner of the lid, then slowly make your way down the straight edge of the can while sweeping your thumb back and forth. Right away, near the top of the label, you will find a large uppercase letter C, which features a long curving lead-in stroke at its top and a small flourish at the bottom. This is the beginning of the manufacturer's brand name, written in white, therefore raised, cursive. Explore the letters, noting the thin shadow that falls to the lower right of the italic font. C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L -L apostrophe S. You might have noticed the unusual lowercase e, which in this font resembles a backwards number three. So I think that's really neat. Uh, first of all, I just love JJ's voice. Number two, I think that that's a really cool thing because I was able to feel that drop shadow. I was able on like the Brillo box to feel the little mark that, makes, that lets you know that it was kosher. They used to be kosher back in the day. Um, the alignment mark from the printer, you can touch that. And so I think it's really incredible that we have these amazing abilities to make these tactile reproductions, but you can make them immersive and multimodal by adding and layering this visual description alongside it. And again, that's really critical for somebody who can't see, but is helpful for everybody, right? It makes it more immersive. Does that make sense? 
All right. So I wanted to talk just briefly, you know, leave us with a few practical tips and tricks uh, for what can we do when we go back from this amazing conference, this amazing city, back to the places where we're getting work done, we have all these deadlines and other things to be concentrating on, what are some little things we can do? So the first one is raise awareness about accessibility and inclusive design in meetings and discussions. It doesn't mean you're gonna solve all of the problems, don't try to boil the ocean, right? But just raise some awareness. Hey, is there, is there captioning on that video? Or um, do we have relaxed performance here? Or uh, is our website able to be used with, uh, you know, with the keyboard? Like I challenge all of you to do that. It, it's not gonna uh, find all of the accessibility uh, issues, but here's a really easy challenge all of you can do. Try to use your organization's website for at least five minutes, try to go to like four or five different pages, and do not use your mouse whatsoever in order to do that. Just, just try to, to make that happen and see what happens, right? And then think about that being compounded with the fact that some of the things may not be labeled for a screen reader user or able to be zoomed in on for somebody who's low vision. And that's the experiences that we're trying to, to mitigate. Does that make sense? Okay, number two suggest and implement small steps at first, all right? So the idea here, again, not trying to boil the ocean, right? You, you can't have peaks without valleys, right? So the idea here is very simple. You want to be able to try some small things, see how it goes, and then build on those successes. And what's really important about like trying these small things is they can be pretty small. You can, you can just be asking about some accessibility affordances or uh, getting a group of uh, school children uh, with disabilities to come visit and just using that as an information gathering session. But to do some small steps like that to really begin the work that then snowballs into, oh, now we have an accessibility working group or now we have an inclusive design advisory committee or now we're working on this project and we're going to go get some funding for it, etc. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Number three, build off of past successes. So the idea here, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, was celebrate the wins. Don't be like, oh, well, that was kind of a small thing. Why are we, you know, we don't need to be tweeting about that and stuff. Celebrate it. Like really, honestly, like work with colleagues and really take joy and delight in what you're doing. If you made something more accessible for some, some, some folks, more inclusive, you were able to engage with new audiences, really take that, take that home and really take joy and pride in that. There's always room to do better. There's always ways of enhancing things even, even more, but really celebrate those wins and encourage others that they can do it as well. Does that make sense? All right. So I want to leave you with uh, this, this story that really resonates with me in this concept of you don't have to be an expert to do this stuff. So I was going skydiving about five years or so uh, ago. Uh, this is over San Diego. Um, and the, the photo shows me plummeting towards the earth at 120 miles per hour. And so absolutely amazing experience. And here's why it was an absolutely amazing experience. So I get there, you have to sign a bunch of forms, so like my estate is not allowed to sue them 25 years after my death and so on and so on. All of the legalese, you have to get that out of the way. Fine, get that all out of the way. Then, these guys are the kindest, most awesome, uh, generous spirits I've, I've ever met. They're like, how can we make this more experiential for you? Um, you wanna stick your uh, legs out of the plane while we take off? To which the answer is, hell yes, that sounds amazing. <laughs> so definitely did that. Right? So we take off, we're like at 15, 16,000 feet, um, uh, you know, about, to, about to, to, to jump out. And he's like, if you want, I can just dangle you out of the plane while we fly around a little bit to give you a sense of how this is going to go. Again, the answer is, hell yes, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Let's do that. And so that happened for a little bit. And then, and then I was telling him, hey, listen, I'm not in this for the view. So like, pull later, right? I'm really in this for the fall, right? So he, he humored me on that, right? And so it was just this incredible experience. And all they did was they started with this core question. This is the question I always talk to visitor services staff when we're doing training uh, with those departments. It's just ask the following question. How may I best help you? Sometimes the answer is, I don't know, and that's okay. You can figure it out together. But if you start from a place of not assuming, right, and just say, how may I best help you, that takes you a really long way. Those guys weren't experts in inclusive design or accessibility, but they made an incredible experience uh, out of skydiving for me. So that's something that just really resonates with me. 
Lastly, I'd like to end with this uh, quote. This is my favorite quote by Maya Angelou. You know, people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but people will not forget how you made them feel. And I think it's really important because earlier in the talk, you know, I talked about influencing how you feel, and we also influence greatly how others feel. And so in this work, you know, by you guys being here this morning, talking with me about these subjects and thinking about these subjects, you're able to make people feel more included. You're able to not have them feel excluded from our institutions and from our global discourse. And that, to me, is really, really important. So I want to thank you for doing that, and I want to thank you for having me today.